Uh, thank you guys for hanging in there. And uh, sorry for you know being a little bit late. I had to find parking, which was a little challenging. So, um, so today we're going to be discussing an instrumentation that your university acquired two, three years ago, maybe. Um, so this is uh, the Megatop Molly Top Mass Spectrometer uh, that is really focused on doing high mass analysis. Uh, is everybody here doing MALDI or just kind of interested in the capabilities of MALDI? Yeah. Great, great. So um, I'm going to start off the talk just doing a brief kind of MALDI recap uh, just in terms of how the sample preparation works um, and a little just a bit about the technology. Um, after that, I'm going to just review some of the Shibatsu offerings before going into some of the high mass uh, applications and the uh, Megatop. And then after that, I'm just going to touch on some really uh, cool new developments that are going on at Shimatsu Corporation in the uh, Mass Spec Research Laboratory as it relates to volume uh, mass spectrometry. So, uh, MALDI. Uh, is a, is a technique that's been around for quite a number of years now. And uh, what's really nice about it is the simplicity in the method, especially as it relates to sample preparation. With LCMS, you typically have to separate out your compounds um, or do direct, you can do direct infusion as well. But here you just spot your sample that co-crystallizes with the matrix, uh, and, uh, and then you uh, are going to ionize the dry sample. Uh, Oh, this is just a video. So typically in sample preparation, you have a mixture of your sample that's typically in the picomole, femtomolar range. Um, and then on top of your sample, uh, you then spot the matrix. This is just called the dry droplet method. Some people use sandwich method where they'll pre-spot matrix, let that dry, and then spot the sample. That can help to um, uh, concentrate the sample around the matrix crystals. Uh, so very straightforward uh, sample preparation. Once you've spotted all of your samples, you let them dry. You're then going to load them into the instrument. And this is uh, basically the door where you would uh, load your, your plate. why it rotated all of a sudden. Um, and so then uh, following loading the, the, uh, the plate into the instrument, you're then, you need to form the ion. So in MALDI, you're using a laser uh, that uh, is at a wavelength that is close to the maximum absorbance of the matrix. The laser uh, energy then is transferred by the matrix to the sample to induce ionization. Uh, after which the analytes are going to separate based on their M over Z uh, through the time of flight. Um, in the example of the Megatoth and linear mode instrumentation, you have a direct path from the ion source to the detector. Uh, this is very beneficial for measuring very high molecular weight species, but um, for lower molecular weight species, you can then send them through a reflectron to help focus some of the uh, dispersion uh, of the ions uh, so that you get very high resolution. So we would typically look at mass range, say, uh, 1 to 5,000 to get that isotopic resolution and accurate mass uh, using reflectron mode. Uh, you can still look at higher molecular weight species in reflectron, but you would typically be then still using uh, average, average molecular weight. So Shibatsu has a pretty long history with uh, in MALDI mass spectrometry. Uh, the uh, method was kind of developed simultaneously uh, by Koichi Tanaka and then the Hillenkamp uh, school. Um, but in the end, uh, it was the work that was done by Koichi Tanaka that uh, was noticed uh, and he received the Nobel Prize in 2002. So his method was a little bit different from traditional MALDI in that he was looking at a soft ionization technique um, where he mixed glycerin with the matrix in a sample um, to, to induce the ionization. Uh, so that's a soft laser desorption method. Well, anyway, the work that Koichi Tanaka did then went to form the first 
commercially available Maldi, the Lambs 50K. And back in the day, it was quite um, an accomplishment because it was the first time that people could look at high molecular weight uh, uh, analytes without any sort of uh, fragmentation. And um, this year, we are celebrating 30 years of, uh, of Maldi mass spectrometry at Shimatsu, so we're, we're super excited about that. And then over the years, uh, Shimatsu has uh, continued to evolve their product line. So we had the, um, after the LAMPS 50K, they went to a much smaller format with the Compact. Um, and then they started introducing the uh, CFR, CFR Pluses, uh, which started to introduce uh, Reflectron, um, the TOF Squared, which then led to the Axima series, which uh, the Mega TOF is, is built off of. And then uh, about five years ago, we launched the Maldi 79 u which is our high performance Maldi. And then just last December, we released the new bench top uh, Maldi uh, linear, linear Maldi system that's been quite popular. So this is our current offering, ranging from the small bench top through to the high performance Maldi system. So, in terms of applications for Maldi, the, the demands have kind of changed over the years. So looking at um, back in the early days, in the late 90s, early 2000s, uh, people were really focused on uh, looking at proteins, uh, typically using gel electrophoresis and uh, doing peptide mass fingerprinting, because then there was no um, uh, commercially available PSD, post-source decay, or CID. Um, and then uh, from there, people uh, were able to use the high mass capabilities to start looking at intact proteins, um, but maybe a little bit limited in terms of the molecular weight range. Um, then in the 2000s, people started using this, the, the method of uh, Maldi imaging. Uh, I just came from a Maldi imaging uh, conference, and it's amazing to see kind of how instrumentation has developed around that application. Um, and then, uh, really, the, the resurgence of Maldi came in the form of microbial identification using uh, protein fingerprints to be able to quickly identify microorganisms uh, by comparing them to a database. And this is uh, popularly commercialized by Biomary Rutger, uh, Biomary partnering with Shimatsu to provide the Bitech MS system. Um, so, you know, there's a whole diverse range of Maldi applications, um, which it oftentimes doesn't matter which instrument that you have, uh, as long as you have that Maldi, uh, Maldi source. So uh, as it relates to high molecular weight proteins, uh, there's, uh, or just in terms of characterizing a protein, there's many uh, types of experiments that can be done using Maldi to uh, investigate like the N-terminal sequence. So people are using a technique called in-source decay, where you're basically using the laser energy to destabilize the protein and allow it to fragment along the flight path to get the N and C terminal uh, amino acid sequence of the protein. Um, you can do peptide mapping uh, using MSMS. Uh, you can do glycosylation analysis, deamination, post-translational post modifications, basically. Um, a lot of this will require a collision cell and the ability to isolate uh, precursor molecules. Um, what the Megatop will really focus on is some of the more high uh, high mass applications, so looking at intact masses of very high molecular weight species, uh, such as antibodies. Uh, you can also use it for looking at protein aggregation, protein complexes, uh, pegylated proteins. So pegylation is a very popular uh, method for stabilizing drug compounds, increasing its half-life and biological uh, uh, matrices. Um, ADC, antibody drug conjugation, and uh, protein complex analysis. Uh, we kind of covered a little bit of the benefits of Maldi. Very simple, straightforward sample preparation. Has a high tolerance for salt, so um, if you uh, maybe have a, a 
some salts in your buffer for your sample. You don't necessarily have to clean it up. Sometimes you do. Um, very, uh, it leans towards the high mass detection, so you can easily detect your proteins of interest. Um, typically generating singly charged molecules, so the spectra are very simple to interpret and uh, you get good uh, specificity as well. So this is um, an example of uh, looking at uh, high mass discrimination due to the low velocity of ions. So when you're looking at um, high molecular weight species, as they're traveling down the flight path, the velocity, the impact on the detector is, is, is not so, um, I don't know another word to say except for not so good. Um, and, uh, and as a result, you get very low, sensi low sensitivity as you increase in molecular weight. So that's going to affect the amount of sample that you need um, and also the mass range that you can use to look at your, at your sample. So this is just using a simple electron multiplier detector. Now, a lot of times the electron multiplier will be sufficient, um, again, assuming that you have enough sample to analyze it. So, in my experience on uh, just a standard uh, MALDI detector, you can easily get up to 150,000, 200,000. But once you get beyond there, your sensitivity drastically will drop off. And it also, you end up with issues regarding uh, some resolution as well. Um, this is just kind of laying out for you some of the types of molecules that you could analyze using a standard detector versus using a high mass detector. Um, now, there's going to be a lot of overlap with regard to a lot of these uh, proteins like pegylated um, drug antibody conjugates um, because uh, what you're going to gain with the high mass detector is a great deal of sensitivity as well as improved resolution. So even though you can detect them with the standard detector, um, you're going to see improved results with the um, high mass detector. So when you're talking about your standard MALDI, um, I kind of like to think of the, uh, the Megatoff as like the superhero uh, MALDI and that it unlocks some of the powers that uh, a standard instrument wouldn't have. So just as Clark Kent changes costume in his Superman, you've got to do a little costume change for the, for the, uh, for the Megatoff. And so we've exchanged the panel, but we also have the high mass detector sitting on top. And um, really, the uh, what you're able to do is to uh, easily exchange between uh, the oops, uh, the standard mode of operation using a typical um, electron multiplier detector and the Cobalex detector just using. Uh, uh, an I, it's not an iPhone, it's the iTouch, or what do they call I forgot what they call them these days, but it's just a little uh, uh, tablet device that you can uh, click a button and it'll, it'll switch in and out of position. Okay. So the way that the, um, uh, the Colex detector works is it's basically a conversion diode. And so um, as the, uh, as the, Antibodies or the high molecular weight species hit the detector, um, the, uh, the conversion dynode is going to then kick off secondary ions. Then these are going to accelerate through the, um, through the dynode to a secondary detector where you, with a kind of a cascade effect. So you're going to kind of be amplifying the signal to increase the sensitivity. And so um, this is just kind of to lay out for you where the uh, linear detector specification for Shimazu ends and how much farther you can go with the, uh, the Kovalex detector. And so this is just kind of showcasing what the difference is in terms of the sensitivity levels that can be achieved. So these are scaled to the same value where on the top you have the electron multiplier and then the megatop detector on the bottom. So you can see you get much higher sensitivity of detection with the, uh, with the Kovalex detector. Okay. 
All right, so here with, uh, with uh, sample preparation for uh, these high mass applications, you're typically going to do a, uh, a serial dilution of your samples to try to optimize the um, conditions for analysis. You're then going to take these dilutions, mix them with matrix. You can either pre-mix them in a tube or you can mix them on the plate. And just as uh, illustrated before, you then load the plate into the instrument for analysis. Okay. All right. So I wanted to talk a little bit about um, just kind of the issues in analyzing protein complexes by Molotov mass spectrometry. So what ends up happening uh, when you ionize a protein complex the animation got a little bit ahead of me, um, you are going to dissociate the, the non-covalent interactions. And so what you end up seeing is not the protein intact protein complex, but you see the individual subunits of the, of the protein complex. And so what typically is done is to do some sort of chemical stabilization. So this can be, um, in, traditionally, this is using NHS ester sterification to kind of cross-link the, the uh, amino groups uh, of the uh, two different proteins. And it's a very non-specific interaction. So it's basically going to attach to um, all of the lysines that you have there. All right, so once you've done your chemical stabilization, then you end up uh, detecting mostly the protein complex. Okay. So here's an example that uh, is just kind of illustrating some different uh, types of cross-linkers. These are all NHS esters uh, that um, you can then look at this uh, glutathione uh, S transferase uh, and looking at the uh, uh, the uh, comparing the, the efficiency of the cross-linking with the two-minute reaction. And so uh, GST forms a dimer, and so you would expect that with the cross-linking you should see the, the double mass, um, the 2M uh, plus, as opposed, to the, um, as opposed to the single mass. So you can see with these, uh, the purpose of this publication was basically to showcase uh, some cross-linking, some new cross-linking reagents, and showing kind of a lack of efficiency of some of the traditional cross-linking reagents. And uh, Kovalex, who builds the detectors, they um, have created uh, these homobifunctional amine reactive cross-linkers. So you've got uh, the, react uh, the reactive groups on both sides, and they created kind of a, a recipe of different lengths of cross-linkers to help um, not only uh, improve the efficiency of cross-linking, but also the, uh, the completeness of uh, cross-linking. Okay. Now, one of the questions that often will come up is uh, when you're doing these types of cross-linking experiments is to make sure that you have some specificity and that you're not cross-linking just random molecules together. And so oftentimes what people will do is they will during the method development is they'll spike in some protein that they know will not bind to the protein of interest. Uh, so they'll have their, their protein complex and then additionally some uh, protein like albumin or in this case ubiquitin uh, to ensure that they're not getting those non-specific complexes. Now in this case there is a small amount of non-specific uh, uh, complex formation. Um, so what you want to do is to also have some sort of control experiment where you do not cross-link and just verify that, um, uh, that the levels are, are very similar. So, this, so uh, these are going to be related to plume aggregates, so the, 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 uh, which we'll talk about in a little bit. So you can get some uh, complex formation in the gas phase as well. So this is just another example of uh, complex analysis looking at uh, uh, looking at antibody antigen binding interactions. Um, so here they're using their uh, their mixture of uh, cross-linking reagents, and um, 
just showing that you're seeing what you should be seeing with cross-linking and without cross-linking. So in the no cross-linking, you see exclusively the individual subunits. Uh, with cross-linking, you're seeing the, um, the complex formation. Okay. And this is two examples. You have the uh, anti-prion protein antibody, uh, and then you're also forming, and of course with an antibody, you would expect to have two groups attached to an antibody. So what you would expect to see is maybe a certain degree of a uh, single uh, a single unit bound to the antibody, and then a, and then sometimes you'll see two uh, two uh, antigens binding to the antibody. So, uh, although it's maybe not necessarily complex formation, protein aggregation analysis is very similar in terms of how you would do this type of analysis. And so, uh, you can see with uh, antibody cross. Uh, sorry, antibody aggregation, the molecular weights can really kind of get out of control very quickly. So even with uh, six antibodies, you're already at almost a million Daltons. And so just like with the protein complexes, what you're going to do is uh, to do the cross-linking of your uh, antibodies uh, in solution. Uh, it takes maybe a couple of, uh, of hours for that uh, reaction to complete. And then uh, you're going to analyze um, your sample uh, without uh, cross-linking and then compare it to what it would look like with cross-linking. And what you want to do is, of course, control for these plume aggregates. So this is with no cross-linking, but if you crank up the laser power, you're going to see a lot of these uh, dimers, trimers, and tetramers, even though they're not really existing in, this, in solution. And so you want to decrease your laser power to the point where you don't see any plume aggregates uh, to try to control for that. So uh, it's just a question of kind of controlling that laser power. So once you've done your cross-linking and you verify that you've got the right conditions to analyze for these aggregates, then uh, you can see you get um, very stable, you get the stabilization and you can start to analyze uh, uh, for these, for these uh, uh, sub-visible uh, protein aggregates. So these are the types of uh, 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 molecules that you wouldn't necessarily be able to see by traditional light scattering techniques. Um, you can take it a step further and you can do offline separation. So this can be a orthogonal to GPC uh, analysis. So you can do the GPC fractionation collect the fractions, and then analyze uh, uh, for these uh, aggregates. And that might give you a little bit uh, more sensitivity towards the higher end of things. So I'm not really an expert in the other areas, um, but uh, this is just to kind of show that, um, uh, that there's uh, other orthogonal to, to MALDI, and that MALDI is kind of right along there with these other methods in terms of its reliability um, and ability to detect some of these, uh, some of these high molecular weight species. Um, one of the things to kind of uh, keep in mind is that uh, uh, the, uh, some of the methods like uh, size exclusion chromatography is you need to kind of target specific mass ranges. Um, and if you go outside of those mass ranges, then you might get an inaccurate uh, measurement. Um, so specifically, like uh, some of the dimers might be underestimated uh, with size exclusion chromatography. Um, so they might not have the diversity of mass range that all you can offer. Um, and uh, additionally, in some cases, again, I don't, I can't even read these uh, figures, but um, you know what you need to know is that uh, assumptions sometimes need to be made when using light scattering techniques and ultra centrifugation methods. Okay, so when you're comparing to some of these orthogonal methods, uh, MALDI has several advantages, including speed, resolution, and mass accuracy. Um, I think there could be, uh, you could gain more information, especially when you're comparing MALDI to size exclusion techniques, you get all that mass information. 
Um, and then the sample prep is very straightforward um, and pretty quick. Uh, and uh, now uh, the detector goes up to 2 million Daltons, so it gives you even more uh, capabilities. So another area of interest has been the protein drug conjugates. Um, so in this case, what people are doing is they're cross-linking uh, like drug compounds to antibodies or other uh, proteins to try and uh, get more uh, specific targeting of their uh, biomarkers. So um, it's, it's a way to specifically deliver a drug target to just the cancer uh, or disease uh, diseased cells. So this is typically the workflow. Um, so uh, you are going to, it's very similar to cross-linking uh, where you would have some sort of uh, uh, derivatized uh, drug compound that would then bind to the antibody. Um, so you have a linker that's NHF, that's typically NHS esterified, um, and then you're going to incubate it for a couple of hours. And then once you've uh, got your uh, linker on there, then you bind your drug compound to the linker. Okay. And this is an example uh, that was done by our collaborators at Walter Reed, uh, and they were looking at uh, albumin bound to uh, uh, haptin. Uh, and so basically what you can do is you are going to acquire your mass spectrum with no cross-linking, and then you can do different time points to determine uh, kind of what is the optimal condition for the cross-linking uh, reaction. And what you'll do is you can see the linker ratio increasing over time. Sorry, I keep looking here, but it's up there. So uh, you have the linker ratio and the number of, oh, sorry, they're not optimizing based on time. They're, they're increasing the linker ratio to, um, to try to increase the number of haptins that are binding to albumin. And this was all about uh, trying to find a vaccine against opioid addiction. Okay. Um, and uh, generally speaking, samples are run in triplicate. And the reason to do that is basically to kind of average out any discrepancy in molecular weight that might be related to uh, just the shape of the peak or um, uh, any sort of decreased resolution from laser power. Okay. This figure is just basically uh, showing how the MALDI system compares to some of the traditional methods. Uh, so in terms of analyzing these uh, drug conjugates, people will oftentimes use um, like a derivatization method followed by uh, just some UV detection. Um, and so uh, the TMBS or trinitrobenzene sulfonic acid derivatization, uh, basically you can see it's going to underestimate the number of haptins that are attaching to the drug molecule. Um, the other point to make is that these sterilization methods are both indirect, whereas MALDI is giving you a direct measurement of what you actually have. Okay, so protein pegylation uh, is still very similar. You're pegylating your protein using a linker and uh, a, uh, a, a peg uh, molecule of a, of a certain length, that this is done to basically stabilize uh, drug compounds in biological uh, solutions. And so uh, we were looking at uh, goat anti uh, rabbit antibodies um, and uh, looking at a dilution curve. So here we have uh, the goat anti-rabbit standard, so this is without any cross-linking. And then we have goat anti-rabbit 10K, so this is just basically the um, 10,000 Dalton uh, peg linker. And then we have the 25K as well. And uh, all you need to do at that point is to uh, just compare the different uh, uh, conditions and look at the mass differences uh, over multiple acquisitions. And you can see why it's somewhat important to do multiple acquisitions from this figure. As you can see, uh, the, the peak shape has some variability here. 
Um, and even though the apex of the peak is the same, it could be it could be shifting around a little bit. And so we typically do our measures three to three to five, typically um, uh, off of the same sample. Okay. Uh, and so from here, you can calculate uh, with the GR10 and GR25 the number of linkers. I mean, it's a pretty straightforward measurement. I'm just doing a uh, division of the mass shift by the, the molecular weight. So from this presentation, you know, I've given a lot of the positives, but there are some drawbacks to MALDI as a method. Um, it's considered more to be a qualitative method. People are not typically using it for absolute quantitation, but it can be very complementary to more quantitative methods such as like QTOF um, analysis. Um, you might require some cleanup. A lot of times you can get away with no sample cleanup. Uh, so this could be a very uh, simple, you know, putting a drop of water on your sample and then removing it 10 seconds later to try to remove, wash off some salts. There's uh, a lot of uh, uh, tips that you can buy that would allow you to just do a quick cleanup. Like a, it's basically like a little HPLC column on a, on a tip. Um, and you can do that quite straightforward. Uh, dialysis is another technique that I've used in the past. There's lots of different methods for that. Um, and then uh, for looking at uh, drug conjugates, uh, looking at mass shifts and stuff like that, the resolution of the instrumentation might not be sufficient for looking at small changes because you can see in some of these figures like this one, the peaks can be quite broad, so looking for a small shift in molecular weight might just not be possible. Okay, are there, before I move on to some of the future, future directions, are there any questions? No? Yeah. So what's the maximum mass that you can see in my Oh, good. I, I never seen the problem. Yeah, so uh, I've, we've seen, um, the most that I've personally seen uh, is in that figure on the aggregates. I think it was like 1.2 million Daltons for the nine bird. Um, I haven't looked at anything beyond that, but I'd be, I'd be curious to know like if you could see a, di a dimer of IgM at like almost 2 million Daltons, because that would be uh, like 1.8 million Daltons. I haven't tried it though. So uh, I don't know where the specification comes from or how they even verify that spec, but um, it's a good question. Great. So, um, so uh, let's see. So, Shimanzu, I mentioned a while ago that uh, Koichi Tanaka won the Nobel Prize. He still works at Shimanzu. Um, and has a mass spec research laboratory that's dedicated towards promoting life sciences, and particularly his preferred method is uh, Molly Toff mass spectrometry. And um, there's been a couple developments that have recently come out of his lab, um, one of which we've commercialized, and this is the AFAP Molly matrix. Uh, the AFAP matrix is a special uh, Molly matrix that focuses on ionization of hydrophobic species. So this could be hydrophobic proteins, like membrane proteins, or the digested peptides from these, from these proteins. And we're looking for new ways to use this matrix, so if you have any ideas about what you might want to try with this, we'd be happy to send you some, some sample matrix to just try it out on your own. And this is an example just kind of showing, uh, let's see, uh, the, transmembrane, the transmembrane domain. Um, and being able to selectively ionize the, uh, uh, the hydrophobic peptides. So you can see uh, the stars uh, are representing uh, the hydrophobic uh, peptides and the circle is more the hydrophilic. So you can see very few hydrophilic peptides are being detected there. <coughs> Excuse me. And then uh, finally, uh, we're, uh, one of the areas that uh, Shimatsu has really been focused on has been uh, Alzheimer's disease. Uh, there's a big epidemic in Japan as the population is continuing to age, 
uh, in dementia. And so uh, Shamasi has really taken on this, uh, this whole project of improving uh, detection and, uh, uh, yeah, basically trying to come up with easier and earlier ways to detect dementia. And so the Kuichi Tanaka Lab, in collaboration with two universities whose names I can't think of off the top of my head, uh, they developed this test that basically circumvents the ability, the need for PET scans or the need to do a uh, spinal tap to get the CSF. Those are currently the only methods for detecting these uh, amyloid beta proteins. Um, and uh, so what they do is they take a drop of blood and they basically are going to do immunoprecipitation of the amyloid beta protein fragments and they're going to be looking at the ratios of these, of these uh, protein fragments to uh, correlate the data to a disease state or a non-disease state. And uh, they've been able to show with this data uh, much earlier detection than, uh, than the current methods. And it's also much less evasive, much less expensive, um, and uh, a lot faster as well. So, uh, so we're very excited about that. Um, it's a little bit tricky because you have a test for a disease that has no treatment. So what do you do with that? Uh, you know, so um, you know, the idea would be that this could really help facilitate drug discovery and looking at clinical trials to see the uh, effectiveness of drug treatments. So we've been very excited about that and we're starting to offer that as a service. Uh, so, and that's going to be uh, kind of based on this whole MALDI 8020 platform, which is the uh, benchtop MALDI system. And I, I, I don't know that I need to, I don't know how, we're kind of over time, but we started, you know, pretty far into the presentation anyway. Um, but just wanted to kind of showcase uh, some of the uh, uh, nice features of our new instrument. Uh, it's uh, pretty inexpensive relative to a lot of the systems out there, uh, very fast. So this is uh, working with a 200 hertz laser, um, and the pump down time is, is really quick as well. Um, very, the whole idea of it is to make it a very simple to use instrument. And uh, just kind of to tell you a little bit about future developments, you know, we are investigating the possibility of moving the Megatop platform over to a benchtop model. Um, you know, there's some complications because it's a much smaller flight path, so uh, there could be some limits there, but uh, we're, we're just getting started on that project. So hopefully, you know, next time I come out, I can share some more information about that. So, um, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, some of the uh, work that's been uh, done. So, uh, Professor Günther Altmaier, Altmaier uh, out of uh, Vienna, Austria, uh, Ryan Wenzel from Kovalex. Uh, you know, Professor Altmaier is always very willing to uh, help us and uh, share his data. Um, he's uh, been a pretty early adopter of the uh, Kovalex detector and. The uh, detector, of course, comes from Koblex, where uh, Ryan Wetzel does all the kind of business development. And then uh, my team back at uh, SSI, Lindsay uh, Buta, who's and uh, Ryan Walsh. So that concludes my presentation. I don't know if you have any questions. Uh, you can discuss any, if you're working on some samples and have any questions I can try to answer them. Or we can wrap up. <laughs> Brian will be over in the depth near the instrument for a while. Yeah. Um, you're staying around. Uh, if you want to come over and talk to him about problems, anything like that. Or any things. ideas you have. <laughs> it doesn't have to be problems. <laughs> no, I'm a problem. Yeah. <laughs> Delano, did you have anything you wanted to cover? No, I'm sorry. You're good? No. Okay. Great. Well, thank you so much for your time and for your patience. Um, it was a little bit of a, a mess this morning, but I thank you for hanging in there. My bad. It's all good. <laughs>